All right, uh, back unexpectedly with uh, another shootout hockey video here. And an idea, actually, that uh, I got another idea. A thousand percent credit for this idea goes to PJet. It's, uh, this came from a comment that he, that he left, actually, in a previous uh, video, I guess, that I, that I did for this. Uh, I wasn't going to do the 47-48 replay season like this, uh, and I won't, I think, in time to come. I, I, I will at least try doing something differently. But for the time being, I decided to try out another video because of something that PJet, again, all the credit goes to him, something he said in the comment about a, another way that I might be able to uh, play through a game with fl uh, fast action cards and not have to necessarily shuffle quite as excessively as I would normally and still get a good random mix in the deck. And so I'm going to experiment with this game. I'm going to try this out in the project itself. This is not an exhibition game or anything. As a Habs fan, it really can't get much worse for them at this point. The 6-7-1 record, which by the way does match where, where they were in 47-48 historically, uh, they were 6-7-1 coming into this game here, this game being played on November 23rd of 1947. It is already the 23rd over here in South Korea. It is not quite the 23rd um, anywhere in North America yet, I don't think, but it will be in some places, at least in another hour or two. Uh, but anyway, they're up against 6-7-0 Boston, who I would argue that their record actually is a little misleading and that Boston, I think, is a better team than that. In real life, they were 8-4-1 going into this. And so they've just had some bad breaks. But speaking of bad breaks or just badness in general, uh, Montreal, <laughs> in my replay, not in real life, although in real life, actually, things weren't too good for them necessarily at this point. But uh, And I'm, I'm referring historically as well. But anyway, they were... Um, they have been outscored by a combined score of 17 to 5, 17 goals to 5 in uh, their past couple of games. They're coming off an 8 2 drubbing to the Rangers last night. And then uh, a couple and a few nights before that, it was uh, what would it have been? 9 3, <laughs> the loss to the Chicago Blackhawks. And it wasn't that long before that, actually, another game that Bill Dernan was in that he surrendered 9. And I thought, how many times did that happen in Dernan's career? So. Anyway, I guess so without any further ado on this one, I'm going to show this is again based entirely on something that PJet suggested in a comment. I've, I'm trying this out for the very first time on camera here. I've not tried this out off camera, but I want to give this a shot. And again, all if I haven't said it enough already, all kudos, all credit goes out to PJet, whom uh, I liked actually uh, yesterday when I was watching and listening to a DDSP commish do his 73-74 Habs Rangers game, another game, again, the Montreal didn't look too good in, uh, that uh, he called uh, PJet's uh, series of videos on how to play shootout hockey. And I'll try to link to some of those in the description to this video on the off chance that that someone who might see or hear this has not seen or heard his videos for this game. They enticed and won me over to shoot out hockey, and I, I'm sure the DDSP uh, commission said similar. But in referring to PJet's videos, one thing that he said that I concur uh, on completely is that they are the Bible of uh, his videos. Like They're like the Bible of... Um, well, shootout hockey videos. Anyway, he said it better than I did, but oh well. <laughs> it's not a competition. So uh, I'm going to get things started here. And actually, because before I was see it was easier, I was doing the I was doing the cut and switch. So already I might have to make a minor adjustment here. But uh, oh no, it's okay. All right, uh, let's see here. So this is PJet's idea. Uh, first, you're going to take three minutes to time up. No, that's uh, that's shootout hockey. Anyway. Uh, take three minutes here off the clock. So we're up to, uh, well, yeah, we're up to about three minutes into it. And oh, what's this? A second discard pile. Yeah. I might even go with a third and a fourth. I'm going to start with two for the time being. So uh, 63, that is narrowly out of Boston's range where we get two more minutes off the clock. Now we're up to the five minute mark. And that's going to be a scoring chance for the Boston Bruins. And that goes to Play Ray. Play Ray is actually Pipa Bondo in the third line, but Bondo at the blue line with it. And Bobondo, it's going to be Bill, or sorry, not Bill Dern, and Jerry McNeil. That's right, two net minors in this game. Didn't mention that, didn't mention the scoring ranges. Boston scoring chance range, 68th is 100th, the double O, which I treat as 100. I think you're supposed to anyway. And Montreal, I'm quite sure that you are. Montreal from row 1 to 17, two goalies in this game. One is a Hall of Famer, the other is Jerry McNeil. Though McNeil in his own right was also, you know, glancing again at his career and sort of a post Bill Dern and pre Jacques Pallant, Jerry McNeil, not without his solid seasons and performances in Montreal. If you look at his Wikipedia, in fact, referred by, I think it was Detroit coach, probably 
Tommy Ivan then said it was like the best goaltending they had ever faced in one particular playoff series. Anyway, so we got a big save check here, and he has Bobondo from the blue line. That checks out. So, um, sorry, I said Dernan save check again, didn't I? I'm so I'm so used to it. Jerry McNeil with the six there. McNeil makes a save and a five to nine, keeping this game scoreless. We're gonna get two more minutes here off the clock, up to minute seven. And there's going to be a penalty, possibly, to the Boston Bruins. I'm looking for a VZ2. Do I see a V? I do. Flamin was the first V I happen to notice. I'm going to say Flamin is in the box. I don't track penalty stats uh, individually for this season replay, so I just basically look at a guy, and for purposes of reporting it, just having fun on Delphi, I just look at a name, and I, I say, okay, he's in the box. So you get Flamin in the box here for a pair. And uh, we're up to about, and I'm losing track here where I'm discarding them. So we're up to about eight minutes into it. With that 67, though, that's actually a near shorthanded miss for Boston, at least the way I do it. And then the second one, that's definitely going to be a shorthanded chance, and then some for the Bruins, where we look to R. Let's see, as long as R is not flamming, because that'd be another little house rule that I do. Uh, no, it's going to be Johnny Pearson, actually, from the second line. No penalty rating at all. So we have Pearson here. That'd be into the ninth minute as well. And uh, Pearson does not have the shootout, uh, or sorry, the shootout, the shorthanded goal. So uh, we're going to take some more time off the clock here, where, of course, we're going to get a save check. It's just my luck, but that's not how I do it. I've mentioned this in videos before. It's always the blue line. So I just don't bother. I'm quite sure it's always the blue line. So I just don't bother with that. So anyway, we're up to minute 12 now. That was just for time, not for chance. And it looks like we could have another penalty to the Boston Bruins. We're looking for the X, Y, 2. I don't see an X and I don't see a Y, 2. Boston's gotten away with one here at the Garden. So uh, we go, and sorry if that was terrible. So we go anyway, we got to 12. We got 12 uh, still. And 43, so it looks like now there could be a penalty for Montreal. Uh, Montreal, we look to the YX2, the YX2, and the X2. It's going to be Rocket Richard. Rocket Richard will be boxed here for a pair. So in the initial minute here, that's going to be a power play chance for the Boston Bruins. Somehow this one is still scoreless. Uh, that could be right about to change, though. Player U on Boston is uh, you on Boston to be uh, Paul Ronti from the second line. Ronti here in the power play where he has it in the slot. And we have a one nothing hockey game here. Score! i got to work on my whatever. Scores. Scores. So Paul Ronti here has scored for the Boston Bruins. And let's get the exact time of the goal. So time of the goal there, we're going to say a 12.50, L1-D1. I think what I might do actually is assume that Ronti is the fourth forward. Again, just various ways that I play around with the game a little bit. Not as concerned maybe with granular uh, facsimile historical accuracy as some might be. I, I think realistically, again, if a lot of hockey could be replayed, and again, it's just my .02, I can't get into a time warp time machine and prove it, at least not yet, but I really don't think you would get there's just so much that can happen in hockey, bounces, inches, calls, good and bad, that I really think if you could really replay a season for real, you'd have a hard time actually between injuries and just all kinds of other things that can happen. Again, an inch or two either way. Uh, you'd have a really hard time reproducing statistics accurately. So anyway, where was I? Um, so I believe, uh, but that, but that, but I have the 25 there. <laughs> Goodness. Oh, terrible multitasking. Okay, so yeah, no, the L1D1, so sorry if I've already turned over a card here. But we're going to say Ronti from first line right wing there, Jimmy Peters. And Jimmy Peters can't assist twice. We'll look at the third card here where it's going to be nobody. So straight up Ronti from Peters here in the power play at 12.50. Boston up one nothing. We take another minute off the clock now. Into about 14 minutes now, narrowly missing a scoring chance again to the Boston Bruins. Montreal could have used that card, but it isn't theirs to use. No chance there for either team. Three more off the clock now. We're up to about two minutes to go here in the frame where Montreal will finally get a chance. Chance to tie it here for player Y. Player Y is Elmer Locke, the front line, looking to take back his uh, scoring lace, uh, scoring lace, scoring race lead, tied with Gay Stewart with 22 points right now in the season. And uh, Locke has it in the slot in order to try and do so where he scores. He's successful. So, Elmer Locke has tied the game here. Let's see how much time exactly. We're going to say that's at 17.29. We'll look to L1-D1. And it's going to be Locke from, 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 oh my goodness, Locke unassisted. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, so... 
Uh, two more off the clock now. That brings us to an even 20, which I do actually play out. So 19. Again, Montreal narrowly missing, as long as that's not a zero, zero minute, and it isn't. So anyway, now these cards should not, again, They I've been going back and forth. They should not appear in the same order. I will do some shuffling. What I like to do is I take the cards, discard it, and I mix them in with cards that have not, uh, that weren't used, I guess, during the period, I could say. I do shuffle after every period. And, but again, I'm not going to worry too much about shuffling too excessively. I don't think I have to be all that concerned with getting a repeat of the first period. Now that I've said that, watch in the second period, much like the first, it will be Paul Ronti scoring, assisted by Jimmy Peters, and then later on, Elmer Locke will tie the game again. We'll see if we get something like that. Uh, penalties in the frame, we had Rocket Richard was in the box uh, for a couple, Fern Flamin for the Bruins as well, so a couple of Hall of Famers there sidelined i guess for a tenth of the period and uh I, I will do the full it's just uh, it's something about it's when i'm holding these hundred cards in two hands it's hard not to shuffle but anyway we're about 11 minutes into this so let's get things going for period two and again i just want to see if the pjet uh the suggestion the idea that he sort of came up with in the comment if uh if it works, if it's effective, let's see if we're going to get a lot of the same incidents and instances. Even if we do, that's not necessarily an indication that it doesn't work. A lock scoring chance is hardly an unusual thing. But two minutes off the clock here to kick off the second period. Where with the 13, Montreal, a chance to go ahead. It's going to be player D, Elmer Locke, again, looking to follow up. What did I say moments ago? Locke this time with it just at the blue line where it's going to be Brinzik. Test to make a big save here. And with the six, indeed, much like Jerry McNeil in the opening frame, uh, he does it. So we're going to take two more off the clock now. We're up to about minute four, where we're going to get a scoring chance the other way for the Boston Bruins. It's going to be player H, Milt Schmidt on the front line. Milt Schmidt here from the faceoff circle. And what's it with all the save checks in this game? Jerry McNeil with the 80 successful. This has become somewhat of a goaltending showdown here between McNeil and Frank Brimzik. Okay, three more minutes come off the clock now. Up to minute seven thereabouts. We are 77. Another chance here for the Bruins, who underwhelmed, if anything, in the opening frame. That is Murray Henderson. I remember Murray Henderson from my 47 replay. Henderson here, he has it. Just at the blue line, however, where he's boxed out, unable to get through. Three more off the clock now. We're up to about the midway point of the game. And it's going to be Montreal, somewhat surprisingly to me, with another chance. They're getting a lot of them here, a little more than I'd expect. It's Rocket Richard with it here from the face-off circle. That one doesn't go through, but he gets the rebound. Two to the right wing, also Rocket Richard, where Brimzik's rebound rating is three. He's made another big stop. Three more off the clock now, up to about minute 13. Speaking of Montreal and Rocket Richard, that is a number nine. That is a Montreal scoring chance. Player L, it's going to go to, I believe it's Norm Dussault. Not as familiar with him. Didn't play. At least he isn't in the Mike Owens Quick Play Pro Hockey care for the 47th season. I don't recall anyway. But anyway, it's going to be Al here, Norm Dussault. And uh, he has it here in the faceoff circle. Does do so where Frank Brimzik makes another stop. And we get another three, a somewhat fast-moving second period relative to the first. That's a good indication to me that the cards have been mixed up well. Things are happening differently here. We've yet to have a penalty in the frame. And I've not forgotten as well. That does mean a scoring chance for the Boston Bruins where player V. Player V is going to be Quilty. Quilty, who I think also gave you some time in Montreal. He's evidently with Boston for this game. And he has it in the slot. So, yes, it's going to be the Boston Bruins taking a 2 nothing lead. Or 2-1 lead, rather. Not two nothing. Here in uh well here late in period two and <laughs> just interrupted with the thought upstairs that in real life as well this was a two two tie, this hockey game. So Montreal went to six seven and two and Boston went to eight four and two. I think I mentioned already Boston was eight four and one coming into this game in real life. But here at we'll get the time of the goal. At fifteen fifty nine, a second shy of the sixteen minute mark, we get uh Quilty scoring the goal, I guess. Quilty for uh, Boston and assisting of, sorry, bench, and then that's appropriate, and then D2. So uh, there is a bench right wing there. Graham Warwick over from the Rangers at some point. And left defenseman for D2 is Jack Crawford. So it's going to be Quilty from Warwick and Crawford here at 1559. Your score is 2 on Boston. We're going to stay apparently in that minute somehow. There's a second in between there. To fit in another Bruins scoring chance, might have to make a manual adjustment should they succeed here. Player B, it's going to be Woody Dumar from Boston's line one. Another blue line card. But look at that. That's not going to stop him. No in close opportunity, no problem. We have a 3-1 uh, Boston score here. 
uh, because I just can't have nice things. L1D2 here at 55. I'm going to, okay, so two goals, four seconds apart. I don't, <laughs> I'll figure it out post game what I'm going to do. Maybe I'll look at another one of the cards here and I'll say 16 and some change. Not a big deal either way, I, I don't think so. Anyway, L1D2, we're looking. They don't have a six though, and they don't have it. Where have I seen these before? Uh, and then we have left wing and line. So I'm actually, that's what I'm going to do there. The third flip in the assist. I have no problem awarding assist to both Dumart and Jimmy Peters. That's what I'm going to do here. And uh, so we have a 3 1 game for Boston. Sometime between minutes 15 and 16, there it was, uh, um, yeah, Dumart from Schmidt and Peters, I guess it would have been. I'll have to play the tape back. Anyway. Uh, three, if you're young enough, you're wondering, what is he, what is, what does he mean? What is he saying by tape? Uh, so, uh, 84, 84, and, uh, that means three more off the clock now up to about minute 19 where we could have a scrap, uh, one and one, let's, they don't have, no, okay, so, uh, three and four, however, much obliging, it's going to be Pat Egan, Pat Egan bludgeoning Emil Butch Bouchard for Montreal, so it's Bouchard and Egan going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, blow for blow here, that's just going to be a straight cancel out. Put the meats in the box for five. I'm not going to flip any more uh, cards after that to see. So that's good enough for me. Let's see here. Another minute left in the period. We're right up to minute 20. Let's see if anything happens at the last second. Chance for Montreal to get back to within one player. You. That's right. Bob Filion. He wasn't in the fight. Filion is it at the blue line. It's all he has time for and he can't score on it. So uh, we're two periods in now. Boston up by two. Should hardly be surprised, if anything, given that they're underperforming relative to history. They probably are due for a win here. Montreal overperformed, if anything, I think, in the early going. They um, they uh, they were winning some games. A bit surprised, actually, because I know that in real life, Montreal did miss the playoffs this season. Not by a whole lot, so there is kind of that what-if element to it. But, uh, you know, the possibility that they could get into the postseason. Where they actually won... Uh, with my 46-47 Mike Owens uh, quick play pro hockey full season replay, they actually managed to win the cup in that one. Uh, Boston had their number all season, but they luckily didn't meet Boston in the playoffs. So as I'm shuffling here, just talking about stuff you may or may not care about uh, at all. Uh, I, I envisioned this goodwill post-war relief effort, best of seven for them in the post-47 season in the off season. And that went to Game 7, and then Montreal finally got their act together in the seventh and final game of that best of seven Goodwill post-project series. Sometimes I like to do that uh, selfishly I, or whatever, for whatever reason. If uh, two teams that I really like to see meet one another in the playoffs, if they don't meet one another in the playoffs, in the project, then they just do a one-off best of seven. Did that with Toronto and Chicago as well for a 67 King of the Hill replay with Hockey Bones. Anyway... Three minutes off the clock here in period three. Boston up 3-1 and 69. That is a chance for Boston. Their, ch their chance range is so high. I hope I haven't overlooked any. Anyway, it's going to be, it's not hurting them. It's going to be player J here. Joe Carveth, who also spent time in Montreal that season, but he played for Boston in 47. I'll assume he occupied the Bruins for the early portion here. Just at the blue line is Carveth, where already McNeil has surrendered one, but he's not going to surrender another here. So at least not right now. So up to minute six thereabouts in the third period where we could get a penalty to the Boston Maroons. Uh, let's see here. Y and X2. I think they got away with this earlier in the game. They're going to do it again here at the Garden. Uh, two more off the clock. So we're up to about minute eight with the two there. It's going to be Montreal with a chance. Player E for Montreal. Glenn Harmon from the second pairing, the second defense pairing at the blue line. And he doesn't manage to uh, put one through from there. Two more off the clock now. we got about 10 minutes to go in this hockey game. Montreal got to get the rack together and get going if they're going to ever. 89, Boston scoring chances. Not the way to do it for for uh, the Habs player Q on Boston. That is from Flamin from the second pairing. Flamin has it in the slot. And Boston extends their lead to three. Here rather late in the game. It's uh, Firm Flamin for Boston the exact time. Uh, <laughs> I get confused after a little while, which doesn't really matter. I guess this is especially not with this being the third period. L1, D1, and 32, I'm going to say that comes at 9.32 of the third period. And uh, so L1, D1, keep that in mind, technically L1, D2. So it's going to be Flamin Schmidt with another point. And uh, Flamin is the right, def or sorry, I have to look to the six. There is no six. The left defenseman Crawford, I think that's his second point as well. He has a couple of helpers here. 
in uh, Boston's four goal effort. So Flamin from um, Schmidt and Crawford here, 932. Two more off the clock up to minute 12. We go here. Penalty again coming to. Yeah, that's right. Boston got away with one earlier. I was wondering why. Okay, I'm going to say Gallinger. He's the first name that I noticed there. He's in the box for a couple. Where Montreal is going to get a chance here. About 13 in Montreal. Player S on the Canadian. It's going to be Tom. I believe it's Tom Campo. Campo from the bench. Uh, in the slot on the power play. And Montreal getting a little get back here. Maybe it's too little too late. But it uh, doesn't feel quite as bad. Campo here with the power play goal. And I'm I will look to L two D two Campo just being a bench player here thirty two I guess so exactly what uh, three minutes after Flamin's goal uh, Montreal now just down by two and uh, R five on line two they don't have it uh, six on line two they also don't have it in Montreal and the center I'm just going to award the one assist and I'm going to say Billy Ray so Campo from Billy Ray assume that Campo was out there as like a fourth forward or something like that some mixing and matching. And away we go here with about seven or eight minutes to go. Where another two come off the clock now. About five to go here in the game. 88, that's going to be another chance for the Boston Bruins. And S, S, that's going to be Jack Crawford looking to pick up a third point here. He's at the blue line. And Jerry McNeil has figured out how to make saves from shots from the blue line up to set for the time being. Up to 17-5, that'd be a chance for Montreal. Uh, C, that's Rocket Richard looking to score his 13th on the season from afar here. From the blue line, he lets one fly, but no. Uh, so two more off the clock here. Let's see. We're up to about 19 now, just over a minute to go. Where another Montreal chance? They did this in period three, actually, rather annoyingly, against the Rangers, and they were already down by frickin' eight. Anyway, um, um, so that's going to be Ro Maurice Richard again. So he... The nose and the knack for the net. But again, who am I kidding? He's at the blue line. Scratch that, correct that. But Rocket Richard making things mildly interesting, at least here late, uh, has scored here to get Montreal to within one. Let's get the exact time, 1839. They didn't really pull goalies with regularity until about 60, but we'll see here. Uh, so at 1839, Rocket Richard, I will go L1, D1, where Toe Blake gets one assist, and Locke doesn't have a six. Uh, Locke will get the secondary there. A couple of points for him in the campaign. So he restores his lead in the uh, scoring race with a goal and an assist here up to 24 points on the season. I think I forgot and and uh, and had the goalie pulled a couple of times because I'm pretty sure with regular... I know it was done prior to 47, but it wasn't continued with regularity until I think about a decade after this, if I'm not mistaken. Correct me if I am wrong on that um i i look at hockey history a lot but i'm also very forgetful of certain things certain what i remember and what i forget it astounds even me anyway um let's see what we have here okay so it's up to minute 20 anyway we'll assume that we're just playing uh you know five and five and 75 that's going to be boston here looking to add some insurance at the last second pad in their stats here player k player k is murray henderson i think he had an opportunity already Henderson at the blue line, perhaps he's running out of time. He doesn't score from there, and this is not a zero minute. So there you have it. At least it was close in the end. Uh, Montreal, I mean, they were down by three. They got the two goals there in the third period, much like they did last game against New York, embarrassingly. Here it got them back to within one. It's still not quite enough for the Habs, who at least they weren't outscored by a gap margin of six this time. Uh, losing by just the one goal maybe has to feel like a bit of a moral victory, especially where they are on the road. In Boston, they will improve back to 500 now up to 7-7-0 seven, seven on the campaign where Montreal falls to 6-8-1. and one. Anyway, as I like to say, anytime any consideration you give to anything like this, while it's never expected, it's always appreciated. And you can tell that I didn't make this coffee. My wife did. It's a little lighter than, <laughs> than when I make it. Uh, so, um, but, oh yeah, I picked that up just to say cheers, thanks, and bye for now.